On this journey, we knew there would be surprises in store. We expected to meet new people and hear untold stories to learn the truths behind the lore. Along the way, we discovered the hidden gems of Ireland. We arrived in Ireland on a shoestring budget, working with what we had at the time. We are working harder to improve our efforts in the future. Our first night in Ireland, very hard to sleep. Ballagreen, a quaint little place. Well, maybe not so little. The town is absolutely charming. We walked through it and noticed a huge steeple on the other side of town. Knowing it was late, we waited until the next morning. We were admiring a beautiful home with buildings out back. The homeowner was gracious enough to allow us to walk through his home and even agreed to an interview the next day. Tell us about this place. This is an amazing house that we had the extreme pleasure and a good fortune of being invited into yesterday to, to tour. When was it built? I, as far as I know, between 1780 and 1790. 1780, 1790. And it is actually older than the cathedral. The cathedral was built in 1850. Wow. Now, what were you telling us yesterday about that? Because that was the first thing that drew Gwen and I to this area of your town was the immense steeple <laughs> on top of the cathedral. Yeah. Well, this, the, it was, the building was started in... 1850 and it was finished in 1852 Wow! but they didn't have enough money to finish it so in 1901 they completed the steeple okay and that's I don't know did you see it when you went up to the college we actually didn't get to do the college today uh, yesterday no. we're going today right after well, yeah, that's a very interesting place yes yes we just walked past it yesterday yes. but we didn't get a chance to really stop yeah you could do well by meeting some of the glitching Okay, well that, uh, that we're going to make happen. A priest. Okay. The presbytery up there was built before the church. The presbytery is that building that, that is in perpendicular to the church. You know that building? Mm -hmm. That was built before the church. And I have an aunt who reckons that she remembers somebody get married in the... Or her mother told her about someone who got married in the presbytery because there was no church. Wow. And prior to that, before, beside the college was the original church, but it's, it's, there's nothing there now to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, there was settlement around here before the church was built. All this street down here is called Pound Street mm -hmm. because there was a cattle pound because the, the English owned all the land mm -hmm. even though it was the Irish people's land. But they came over and took over, and all the farms had to pay them rent for their own farms. And if they didn't have the rent, they took their their cattle off them and impounded it down this street. That's why it's called Pound Street. Wow. Mm. Amazing. So then the, the, the farmer couldn't pay his rent because he couldn't farm. So the English would come and they'd burn his house down. Yeah. That is that I'm trying to wrap my brain around history and and how they did that. It's it's almost like it's a well played chess game in the fact that they knew the English knew if they did this then this would happen, which True. in turn caused this domino effect, which in turn would get them out. people's land out. Yes. Yeah. They were landlords. Wow. And the landlords came and all the land that was belonged to the Irish people all over the hundreds of years was taken off them and they had to pay a rent if they wanted to stay on the land and if they couldn't afford the rent they took their cattle and impounded it until they could get the rent but they couldn't get the rent because there was no, no cattle to sell they burned their house down and all the houses had uh, straw thatched houses mm -hmm. so 
Uh, it wouldn't take much. And I had to go out. Wow. And it's not just about not having the cattle to, to pay the rent, to be able to sell to pay the rent. That's, a pe that's people's food source. Yeah. And then the famine. Yes. Which, from my understanding, what we have learned is there wasn't a potato famine. This is the famine that, that people talk about here, the people that actually have ancestors that lived the history where it wasn't that they couldn't grow potatoes, it was that they didn't have land to be able to grow anything yeah. on because it was being taken from them. Well, potatoes are very easy to grow. Mm -hmm. So they could grow them on the menial bits of land that they, that, that they were left with. That's why they relied on the potato. Mm -hmm. And they over-relied on the potato. And then when the blight came, it, that it still comes today, but we got a spray that'll get rid of it. Mm -hmm. That time they didn't. And they starved to death. Jeez. Mm. Now, this street, I was able to look up my aunt's ancestry. My name is Phillips, but my mother's name, maiden name is Frail. Okay. I was able to go back to the census in 1901 and my great-grandfather was 85 across the street in a house on the night that they came to do the census and my grandfather was five years of age and his grandfather was sitting beside him at 85 was a, that, that was a big age so that made him okay do the maths he was 85 in 1901 on that day they came so that's what 1825-ish. Wow. Down that street, just across the road from here. So he lived through the famine on this street. That is amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. And it's it's funny. It's I feel like Gwen and I, and I think you would agree, Gwen, that we were drawn to this street. You found us yeah. looking down your alleyway. We yeah. were We were so unbelievably drawn to it after we had went to the church, just down the way from you. Came down this way, looked at your house, looked down the alleyway, drawn in by, by the older buildings that are back there. You were kind enough to bring us back. We were drawn because of what we were well, I spotted feeling. That, I, I, mm -hmm. I seen that you had an interest in it. And yes. I have an interest in it. And I like telling people to think. Because the history is going to pass by and there's going to be nobody to know. Exactly. And I find that sad if it's gone. Because I know most of my friends and all that. I don't care, but I do. I like it. Well, I'm interested. And, and it's and gone, it's gone. One of the things is, and, and whether people believe this or not, even whether you believe this or not, um, I believe we were sent to you because when we were leaving the church, um, we were we were hearing in our own little special way, because we're special gals, <laughs> um, that we needed to ask somebody about the, those who were buried that no one talks about. We asked you, you knew exactly who we were talking about, even if it wasn't in the same context that, that we see things, and you have pointed us up to the college. Is that correct? Yeah. <clears throat> Tell us who, we're ta who we were talking about. Who is buried up there that nobody talks about? The college now might be where... The college was... That was an army barracks. Mm -hmm. But before that, that ever came... Can't give you dates. It's going back two hundred, maybe more. Um, that's where the church was, mm -hmm. but nobody ever remembers where the church or ever seen the church. There's no one alive that was old enough to know. But anybody that was born out of wedlock, they were not allowed to go into consecrated ground, as in the cemetery. They were buried outside the wall, and their parents would be inside the wall buried child wasn't allowed to go in because he was seemingly in, or he or she were in purgatory. Wow. Because he wasn't christened. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, sorry. If the child wasn't christened and died before christening, mm -hmm. they weren't allowed into the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And if a child was born after wedlock. And also, if somebody commits suicide, they were not allowed into the graveyard. And that's not very long ago. No. No, that I do know. That is not very long ago at all. And what I find interesting about what you just said is, even if they were born of a wedded couple, if they had not been christened yet, no, 
weren't allowed. They weren't it. allowed. So a a totally innocent soul. Yeah. From a married family. Yeah. Who just so happened to pass of of no fault of their own. Yeah. Wasn't laid to rest in the same area his parents would be. It's true. Wow. Yeah. That would explain why we were told again in our own special way the way that we were told to ask about them because this is something I truly believe people need to not only know they need to remember yeah. this need these stories need to be told and that is why we find yours so interesting um, it I don't know what your viewers will think of my thinking of this but the Catholic Maybe I shouldn't go down this road. But you go down any road you want. This is my belief. It's my belief for the simple reason, because it's fact. Mm -hmm. The Catholic religion has a lot to answer for. Yeah. And they were so behind the times that it was cruel, basically. Now, as I told you, I got an uncle who was a priest, and he was a very good priest. Mm -hmm. And he was a priest. Mm -hmm. But there was an awful lot. Did you ever see the, f the film called Philomena? Yes, I did. And I, that's it, I it only broke in, my heart. That's only in the 1950s. Yes. That's only 60 years ago. Yes. In Ireland. Oh, yes. It, bro it broke my heart. It did, yeah. I bet it did. And um, so that's what you were up against. Wow. But things are changing. Mm -hmm. Well, they have changed dramatically. But p people just aren't going to Mass as much as they used to, um, which is a pity. My my idea of religion is isn't as cut and dry as the Catholic religion would want. Even though I was born a Catholic, my parents were Catholics. I kind of call myself a Catholic because I was born a Catholic, but I don't go along with the rules, and I don't care. And my religion is don't do anything wrong. Don't hurt anyone else. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to be taught to just do what the Catholic says, what the Catholic religion says. But I still have a faith that there's something there. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to spout and say that I'm an atheist or I, I just don't believe in anything. I do. And I want to believe it. Mm -hmm. Both my parents died. And I'd love to think that I'd meet them someday again. Mm -hmm. So I have that hope in me. Mm -hmm. And that's where the word faith comes into it. And faith is a very big word. Probably one of our main reasons for wanting to do this is so people don't forget. You know, and you, yeah. you bring up your uncle, an amazing man. Yeah, he was. You know, he passed in this house. Yeah. Correct? Mm -hmm. um, you told us yesterday that story. I would love it if you would tell us again. About the last day I met the, him. The last day mm -hmm. with your uncle. Well, he retired. He, he was out in Africa for nine years as a missionary mm -hmm. in Kenya. And then he was moved to California. And he was in California up till late 90s. And then he retired here. He's my mother's brother. Mm -hmm. So he retired here with my mother and my twin brother. We were living here together. And we got on great. And every day he'd go up and he'd say Mass in the college, not the church. He wanted to say Mass for himself. Because he was the real priest. He wasn't... I'm not saying anything about the priests in this place, that they're great, but he was his own. He, he never pushed religion on anybody. And he lived with myself and my brother, and we were fairly wild. But he never judged. He was a lovely man. But he lived here anyway, and he went up every morning and he said Mass for himself in the college. And if a few of the students wanted to go in, they'd go in. And that was that. And he'd come down, he had the same routine. He loved to smoke, and he loved to have a, a, maybe a glass of whiskey at night, and that's he, that was his life, and very good to everyone. But this, he started, he got a few heart attacks, and um, this morning anyway that I was telling you the story about yesterday, he hadn't he hadn't um, gone to say mass in a week, which was very unusual for him because he was sick. Mm -hmm. But this morning I got up and I spotted his car was gone. And because he had a heart attack, and I, we stopped him having any fries, and we were making him eat, you know, cereal. 
But this morning I thought I'm going to treat him because he loved his food. Mm -hmm. And I made him a massive fry because I knew he was gone. I knew he was back at half ten because that's the, and sure enough at half ten he comes in and he used to love to do the crossword. And he got two newspapers, one for me, I was sitting there and where you were, he's where he sat down and he was delighted with the fry. <laughs> and he couldn't believe it and he was starving because he hadn't basically eaten in nearly a week either because mm -hmm. he was sick. So my mother was alive at the time. She was kind of half an invalid. She couldn't come downstairs in a row. So anyway, he ate his fry. I was trying the crossword, couldn't finish it because he was genius at them. He finished his one and I gave him my one to, to finish. And I told him a story about, I won't go into it, about this fella. And it was just a funny story. And he got up and he thanked me for the meal. And he was still laughing at the story I told him. And he went out that door. And just as he was getting out, he turned around and gave me the most lovely smile. As in, I'm shaking his head, as in the story was just like so unreal, stupid. But that was it. So I went upstairs and I got my mother out of bed and brought her down. And I sat her down in that chair. And she says, uh, how was Father Barry? And I says, it's great. And I says, it's, it's, uh, he went out the door laughing and he had a beautiful fry. And she says, oh, it's great. Would you go in and light the fire for me? So I went in to light the fire and he was dead and beside the fireplace. But it was beautiful. Yes. He was 78. Wow. He smoked like a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> he, he went the way he wanted to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, that was, it was just lovely. And then, you, you, I know you're into the, the psycho, or what, what, uh, the paranormal thing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get, I, I, I believe, believe in it, but mm -hmm. I, uh, I never got any feeling with that. I, f I found with people that die belong to you, I'd never be afraid of. Never? No, because they'd never harm you. Mm -hmm. So I, like, some people might come in and say, well, that's where Father Barry died. But they'd say, well, do you not find that weird? I said, no. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't. It's a loved one. It's, it's a loved one that said, died happy. And I also said to you yesterday about my beliefs in religion. Well, mm -hmm. I'd love to see something paranormal. Because mm -hmm. that means there's something. Right. And that would mean that maybe, yeah, someday I will see my parents again. I'd see Father Barry. And see, that, that's, I would love that. But I have... But it doesn't mean that you won't. And it was something very interesting that happened yesterday. And I don't... I don't think you understood the significance of it, but it came from you. We toured your house after learning about Father Barry and seeing his lovely fa smiling face, which I took a picture of you next to his picture. Um, you pointed out, not us, you pointed out every room that we went to, which you have many, <laughs> you have many, many rooms in this beautiful home. You pointed out that it appeared as if he was watching us because every room we went in, there was a picture of him smiling. Yeah, well... How many times do you think along those lines just when you're walking through your own home that he's watching you? But you pointed that out. Whether you realize that or not, even though that isn't him coming and sitting next to you, something told you mm. deep inside that he was quite pleased with what you were doing and how you were explaining his life, his last day, the love of your family in this home, yeah, I mean, and the history of town. Yeah, probably. I believe that, no. Yeah. That's, it's those little things. It's those, what we're calling mm. this documentary is hidden gems. It's those little hidden gems that don't have to prove anything to anybody. Yeah. That's but they the bring you comfort. That's where I go back to the word faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. There you go. Big exactly word. right. That's because he is quite obviously a beautiful man. Yeah. You know, and I think that people need needed to hear this story about him and hear it coming from your lips as somebody that was commendable, that didn't push, Don't. that believed live and let live, shared his faith if you were receptive. If you weren't, he didn't judge. No. He liked his smoke, he liked his whiskey, yeah. he died. He liked his fried, he died happy. Yeah. I don't think that you could ask for more than that. Yeah. 
he was a very good friend of my mother's, as in the brother and sister, but they, they clicked. Mm -hmm. My mother was an interesting character too. <laughs> and she reared three lads. Uh, she had an interviewed husband for years. He died here in this house as well. But, uh, she'd come up with some... The two of them were sitting in that room, right? And he was there watching television and... My mother was like me. She was sceptical. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. She wasn't going to be pushed into it, even though her brother was there across from her priest. Blah, blah, blah. But he'd never said it to her. And then I remember one day, he, or she announced, out of the blue, do you think this is all a joke? Oh my goodness. And he looks over and he just gives her a smile and goes, I believe you hope not. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best. That is the best. That is... <laughs> That is something that you don't you you wouldn't expect. No, that was a good answer. That was a wonderful answer, mm -hmm. and probably the most truthful answer he could have given at that time. No, he didn't know. Because no one he does. He faith, but he yeah. didn't know. For he couldn't mm -hmm. tell her yes or no. He had the faith. Is what he was basically saying. Anyway, yeah, small things little that do happen. I'll give you another example. I have another uncle. All my uncles are dead. Mm -hmm. And. I had another uncle called Jerry, and he retired here for a while, but he moved out from the living house. But he used to go to Mass every morning, and there was two uh, women that were about his age as well, in the 70s. And they used to always go down to Jerkin's restaurant for tea after the Mass. And the ongoing joke was, there was one woman, I can't remember her name was, and she used to always say, you just come up in conversation every morning, there's only one thing that I fear about death is, this tradition here in this town, I don't know if it's in every town, you stay the night in the church that you die, the night you die, before you're buried, the next day, you stay the night in the cathedral, mm -hmm. right? She says, the one thing about death I fear about it is the night all of me on up in the church. I don't mind if I'm buried, but the night in the church, I'd be afraid of that. And my uncle was a bit of a joker, and he'd always come out with something. And I said, don't worry about it. We call her Mary. For saying, don't worry, Mary. I'll be with you that night. And I'll stay with you that night. And he actually would the same man. Wow. But she died. But who died also? Oh, no. no. And the two coffins were side by side in the church that night. That's so the he gospel stayed truth. with her. He was beside her. Like he told her he was there. Oh, that is... Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, that's the truth. And oh it's not God. very often the two coffins up in that church together. It's usually, you know, but the two of them died the same day and he was right with the two coffins lying right beside each other. Wow. That just... Yeah. It's things like that then when, wow. I, when I look back, I think I might tell you that I've kind of never seen anything. Then when you talk, think back the stories, you think, mm -hmm. sure, yeah, there is actually... There, no. there really is. Yeah. The way that you keep your home. Any other, any other person might come in here and change absolutely everything. You haven't done that, and I don't think it's so you. It is. It, I don't think it's all just so you you can be respectful to your family members who passed here. I think it's because it gives you a connectivity. Oh, well, definitely. Yeah. To those, I, I and changed. you know, your mother really doesn't want anything changed. Yeah. <laughs> I right? forget it. And my twin brother would be here with me, and uh, would say, "With my like things have to, some things have to change. Right. Just you know, mm -hmm. life has to go on." But just certain subtle things that I much Barry, my brother, would say, I don't think Mam would like that. <laughs> you know, and then we put it back, and that's the reason it's staying the way it is. Mm -hmm. But that's the way we like it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And then that makes her hair still. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Well, even, even the stove, mm. where your uncle would sit and have, you know, his, his cigarette. Right there by the window, e even all of that is just the fact that his picture is hanging right next to it. The yeah. fact that, yeah, he's I I personally feel like you know I mean he's I feel his energy. I would say that mm -hmm. Quentin feels his energy. Yeah, um, definitely your mom's not so much your dad's. Yeah, not so much your dad's. Um, not for any other reason than the fact that I think it's very bizarre, but it's like no mom's got that. <laughs> is the opinion yeah. that I'm getting 
he stays back because she's in the forefront. But I, I might also say about that is I, I think it depends on the person's spirituality when they were alive. Mm-hmm. That when yes. they hold a presence when they're gone. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, I, my father was a lovely man. He, was, he left us with a beautiful house, and but he just got knocked down with MS. And he was an invalid in that room there for 10 years. But he wouldn't have the same... I don't know, I said anything bad about him. No, 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 father, no, no, no. I loved him to bits. Yeah. But I think that's where the energy that you're talking about might come mm-hmm. from. Because they were so in us. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a good place to end. We're going to talk about what the Archdeacon has on his grave up there. I would never expected to see this on an Archdeacon's grave. Um, you know how you can put a, a simple statement yeah. on your headstone? And his says, life doesn't end, it changes. Never in a million would I have expected such a spiritual remark on such a religious relic as an archbishop's headstone. Yeah. And I think that sums everything up. It's with your family. Um, they have... They might have passed on, but they have not left. No. And you can keep their memory and, and keep them alive, but keep remembering them. Yes. Hmm. Exactly. Tell the stories. Pass yeah. it on. Share the love. My mother is in, is in there. Yes. Oh, yes. And your mother's her, yes. her mother ties, but they're there. And that keeps them alive as long as you keep them there. Yes. Absolutely. And more families need to do that. And I can't thank you enough. Thank you. We really do appreciate you sharing this with us. It's um, it's good to see other people's uh, perspective on things and to hear about their history and, and everything. It's like Vanessa said. I mean, it's this is information that's slowly dwindling away. It is, yeah. You know, and yeah. we really need to have this stuff documented yeah. so that we'll have it in the future. Because it's it, it's sad to see history dissipating it's yeah it's sad well it's people like you that are keeping it alive and fair play to you we would like to take a moment to thank jim for inviting us into his beautiful home rich in history and stories there was so much to learn about this location we couldn't wait to continue to explore and see what else could be found but the beautiful buildings and the stories was just so refreshing. St. Nanthes, the beautiful college that we were talking about, the building was actually built in 1798. It's rumored to have a ghost, a British soldier, who is actually still buried out behind the lot, still located behind the college. It became home to St. Nanthes in 1896. The building is massive, absolutely gorgeous. It was named after the patron saint of the diocese. To this day, a wall can still be seen with the original signage in it. We were directed by one of the men that was working there of a lady that we needed to meet that could fill us in on all the good info of the town. And boy, were we pleasantly surprised. Um, But what about, what can you tell us about this area? what I know from that, from the time I was a child until now, mm-hmm. and that would be, it was a very communal town. It had a very strong community spirit. It was the diocesan town of economy, which in Ireland is quite big and town important. Um, it had markets and fairs, it had a square. And it, the market, the square was first, and then the street grew off it, you know, at tangents off it over the years. Uh, there was a big house on the square. It's now a library, and it's, it's called Dillon House. And a famous family historically lived there called Dillon. And old John Dillon in the 1920s, uh, the time of the truce that was signed between Ireland and England, he was one of the movers and shakers. Mm-hmm. And he signed that truce as well, among all the fathers. Then the house, it was there, and there were people yeah. living in it. A uh, husband, James Dillon, and his wife, and a son. That was in the 1950s, going into the 60s, probably. 
And then the son went away probably to Dublin or where, you know, mm -hmm. most, as a, most of the young do go away. And the older people died, and then the house was empty. But thankfully, it didn't sort of go to rack and ruin, because it was a historic building, and many famous people came there. You may not have heard of Michael Davitt and Darnell, who were very big in the movement for Irish freedom and to the Land League and all that. And they visited there, and many of them dined there. Parnell and Michael Davis. And I would hate to see it go to Rack and Ruin, but it didn't. It's mm -hmm. our local library, and it's very much used and very well kept. Now, the great big building alongside it, which you see running to the left of it, that was once painted all in one colour, which was a unit. And it was theirs they owned then. And it was an absolutely fabulous departmental store. Probably one of the best in the West of Ireland in those years. 1930s and maybe earlier, right? Can't quite remember the exact date, but I know it was our 20s or 30s. And um, they sold everything. The men's tuxedo, women's evening dresses, wool for knitting, patterns, material by the yard made in the famous Foxwood Mills, uh -huh. County Mayo. Um, shoes and boots, leather stuff, their own bakery up at the back, where that gate is, that back gate, they had their own bakery, and they made the most lovely loaves and turnover loaves, you know, that, and they were just delicious. You could get the smell of them baking in the middle of the day, and it was just delicious. Oh, wow. And in the end of October, Halloween, you've heard of it. Oh, yes. Halloween, yes. <laughs> they made a special brack. That's kind of a currenty, fruity little loaf. And it was really made especially special yeah. ingredients. There's cherries and fruit and all kinds of stuff. And I think they put a little dab of liquor in it. Just absolutely gorgeous. And every family on that. And the ring, of course, in it. Uh, every family got one. And what else? That would be one of their specialities. And then gradually, you know, as the, the older couple died and the younger son went down to the East Coast, where all the young go, um, gradually closed down and it was an awful pity but it had to be, that was the way it was and those personally or privately family owned places didn't exist that easily then going mm -hmm. into the next era but the, anyone that served their apprenticeship there young people, men and women came from different parts to serve their apprenticeship there and if you got in there and got their stamp you were set you could go anywhere, you could go anywhere. Wow. You could go to the best places in the 1950s you could get damask cloths, because at that time people had a very good tablecloth for big occasions. A birthday, a christening. They would have these beautiful damask, the real thing, damask cloth, linen and silk, you know, the real thing. And they would have material by the yard, some of it, most of it from the Foxes, woolen mills, down on the Moy in County Mayo. Beautiful hand woven materials, and wool by the ball or the ounce or whatever, and patterns for knitting, men's socks and patterns for knitting, all kinds of things. And there'd be women who could knit, because I knew one of them as a, she could knit and ha hold a conversation and knit the most complicated arrow and never look at it. And then there was a library from way back. We also did a library. It wasn't always held in the most spectacular places, very often in a small room in a private house, mm -hmm. but it got gradually bigger then too. Uh, a little place off St Mary's Hall, which at one time was used as a church before the cathedral was built. And at the back of that was St Bridget's Hall, and there just to be a little library there. But now we have the library in the square in the old Dillon House. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. You just said that when they started a library, yeah. which would benefit everybody, it, yeah. it was in a small room in a private in residence. Small room, yeah, small, small, that small is area. Fascinating. Yeah, small area. I remember, and people go there because people love the library, and they'd cycle in from the outlying areas to the library with their book, and they had about two, book, two books, well, you'll have two books. And there were some authors more popular than others, which can't just think of now. And um, then they moved gradually to bigger premises, now it's in Dillon House. Mm -hmm. And it's very well run, and you could get any book if you order enough that's been recently published, and you get it, you know, the excellent service shops, but there are a lot of shops are privately owned. Mm -hmm. and very often elderly women ran them, you know, and they saw things like snuff. Do you know what snuff is? Oh, yes. You, know, you do? I yes. don't believe it. Yeah, snuff, that, a tiny box that you put snuff in, you know, get an ounce of snuff, you know, and uh, 
Then there was butchers, and they would have the slaughterhouses outside the town, and there was Connors and Regan's galleries, and they would have absolutely gorgeous meat, fresh, reared out of green grass, you know, and um, lamb, lamb in springtime, and beef at other times. And then they also used to do a corned beef of their own, and at Christmas time, a spiced beef that I'd buy it and have it served cold, you know, on St. Stephen's Day maybe. And um, then there were loads of little sweet shops, and they'd sell, do you ever hear of aniseed balls? I believe so. Aniseed because, balls, yes. slightly, I won't say chemically, but slightly, uh, just before opium was served, generally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. They're a little brown hard, and you suck them, and you get a, a good hour out of them if you're lucky, you know. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah. And there was a woman called Mrs. Hallis, and she had a little shop, and she would sell all those kind of things: uh, aniseed balls, uh, salt in blocks like building bricks, and um, sweets in big jars. That's oh, nice. wow! Big jars and um, well, loads of pubs. This town tons more pubs. of pubs. <laughs> they had, uh, tons of pubs. More, time, more pubs than you could think about. Uh, very often the pub was a part of shop, part of pub, you know, but quiet, quietly run, little family places, and very nice, you know. We actually went to Fiddler's Elbow, Fiddler's Elbow yes. today and had, and had lunch. It was wonderful. It was fabulous, it really was. <laughs> and that's what we've been doing for the past, well, since Friday, is meeting with the local townsfolk and and talking to them about the history and their families and, yeah, and everything yeah. and, and there's been one underlying commonality yes of this area and i want to ask you about that and your opinion on it sense of community really not just the sense of community yeah. um a sense of um their their loved ones still being present Yes. Even yes. after they have passed. Oh yes, oh yes. Said they remember people. If you lived and grew up in this town, and somebody mentioned somebody else's grandmother who had long deceased, they'd remember them mm -hmm. and say, "Oh yes, I remember her. She used to love to do such and such on this Friday, or mm -hmm. you know, she used to go to the fair, or she." Used to, and they'd remember a whole lot of things. So it's very personal. It, it really is, and what I found most astounding is they. And, and I hope I'm not being offensive or when I ask this. You cannot this, offend me. You want to go I extremely, you want to go extremely far before you can offend me. I and then I knock the table over, knock the glass over. And then we're all done. The whole world. Then we're all done. Offend away. Go She's on. turning the table over. Yeah. Um, they have really opened up about what we would call in the States, for lack of a better way of yeah. putting it, paranormal experiences. Well, yes, you always you have that. that. You do, please. You, you'll on always, that. But you'll always have that in rural areas where there's a long, dark winter and uh, low lights and sounds from nature, the trees and all that. You'll always have an element of that. And all you have to do is add it to a little bit of imagination, mm -hmm. which uh, for which we are famous, a little bit of imagination, and there you have it. There's no big complicated psychological explanation, you know. Do you feel like it's a little bit more concentrated in this area, or do you feel like it's not much no, different than any no, other area? No. I think love, people would love to think in rural Ireland there's all these people that think we need to believe in ghosts, and they're really looking out the window at night, and they're really going, you know, uh, wrapping themselves in black clothes. No, no. I'm, no, I'm definitely in that into that. <laughs> anyway, and, uh, no, most of the people I know, they would have great respect for the other world. Yes. They'd have great regard and respect, and great respect for the dead, and great respect for the mystery of life itself, you know. But no, they wouldn't be into that superstition -y kind of stuff, no. And a great respect for life is a wonderful way to put it. Yes. Because, and for life and death. Life because, and death, all oh, death. Because you treat with such have respect. That. Most people when they die now, it's different now with funeral parlors and that. Most people when they die now, when I was growing up, were laid out in their own house. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, wakes. 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 I laid out in their own bed, their own house, their hands folded and their rosary wrapped around their fingers, and uh, candles lit, 
and all the neighbours would come in and they'd all sit for a little while and say a prayer and they'd sympathise with each member of the family and, well, and they'd be coming maybe all day and sometimes if you if the house is left open maybe all night as well. Mm -hmm. Now that's changed a bit now, it's become more commercialised. Com yeah, like if once you have it's a good service, good food affairs and that, but it's not as intimate. That's very true, and um, I, I come from a very, very large Catholic background in yeah. my family. Yeah. My mother was, um, we're German and Irish on my, yes. on my mother's side, yes. and uh, she was the 13th child. <laughs> true story. Say no more. Say no more. I hate to say it, but I do think that death was respected a little bit more than, oh, it, is, than it is yeah. now. It's very, kind of very commercial and very chemically, Cold. you know, yes. done up. If they put makeup on me when I'm dead, I will rise up yes. and <laughs> punch them. Punch <laughs> them. Punch them. them. If they put, start making me start to look at, like I'm not. But if they do, I, I, I think it's awful. I think there's something a little desecrating about putting, it's all right to tidy them up and fix them and put their hair and do all that, but to start making them look like they're something else, you know, a pancake and whatnot. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Well, they're still very respectful towards death here, very respectful, like when they go, they will sympathise with the family, they'll say a prayer, they'll sit for a little while, they'll go away, very respectful. And you look at all our population, what percentage of our population occupied America? I, my father's family, and they, they did well in America. My father's family emigrated, and one of his, my grandfather's brother started a um, publishing business in the center of New York, and published it, and became very successful, published a lot of books on history and heraldry and all kinds of things. And my mother was born in New York, on the Lower East Side. Wow. Yeah, and when she was, a, her father died, she and her brother were born there. Her father died, and her mother was a beautiful young woman, beautiful young widow. Her, fa her mother came back to Ireland on the f advice of the family and came to the home place, and the two children were reared there and had a very good, had them all minding them, you know. And I was, so I have a no fashion connection out there. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have been sure Ireland and America are like that, connected yes. by blood. We're more connected by family. Like, it's not just all oh, exports and dollars and whatnot. No, it's not that. We're connected. I remember my grandmother, who lived with us, wearing her long black dress and uh, getting a letter from America regularly, the little air letter. Mm -hmm. She had a daughter and two sons that she went, and because of, like that time, no one's instant air traffic, she never saw them again. And then I remember, I was only about 12, this um, letter coming, and I, we came in for our lunch, and my mother said to us, go over and kiss Granny, she's had bad news. And there was Granny sitting in her old armchair and this blue little fragile letter on her and she cried. And she'd received yet one more letter that yet another of her children had died and she'd never seen them. From the time she saw them off in Cove, she'd never saw them. Like, I remember that. Wow. I li and, you know, my mother said, go over and kiss Granny, she said bad news. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah, three. Um, she went to three. Two sons and a daughter. She saw them off at Cove, the famous place where the ships went from, mm -hmm. and never saw them again. That oh. was it. Letters. They wrote letters. There was no tele big long telephone calls. There was no photograph instant communication. None of that. That is, I guess, probably one of the, one of the finer things about yeah. technology. Is, right. Yeah, you um, could do that. Yeah, we but had that opportunity. The efforts they made to keep in touch. The, the letters my grandmother wrote, she had three, so she was writing three to three different ones. Mm -hmm. Then they had families. Now, you see, what's happened, the sad part of modern life is I'm not much in touch with them. They kind of know us, but not that much, you know. But there is one branch of the family who live in upstate New York in an old place with a fancy name. Can't think of it now. And they came, and when I went out to New York, um, I've been once or twice, you know, mm -hmm. and that's my American accent you hear now. But <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, uh, and we would hope there, and we met them up. We met up with them. My maiden name was Murphy. Okay. Oh, Murphy. Okay. Yes. Yeah, did I where that comes from? And they were Murphys as well. And I used to hear my father, Lord Justin, talk about, you know, such and such a brother of his that went out to such and settled in such a place, and they'd be their descendants. I was so happy to meet them. So absolutely delighted, you know. Oh, wow. That is something that I think is one of the reasons we're doing this. It's so incredibly important.
for for people to see that, like we were talking about earlier, that we're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. There is oh, very much there so. is yeah. there's love there if you choose to reach out. And I really have great. I'm not just saying this. I have great regard for Americans because I think when we went from starvation on the coffin ships mm -hmm. out to America, they got into America and they started off from the ground up and they made success, they worked hard and they integrated and so on. And I always feel a great sense of, for what's the word, family. Yes. yes. You see, they, brought, they all came to America and America was developing, it was opening up and there was room and there was work mm -hmm. and there was everything else, which that time they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. you know? And we all can learn from each other. I've yeah. learned so yeah, much from you today. Yeah. I mean, it's well, amazing. I don't know about that. But we it's no, we did not oh. know. This is the difference in how things are things are taught compared to actual reality. Yeah. We were not taught that the Irish potato famine oh. wasn't because y'all couldn't get yeah. food that way. We were not told the history yeah. behind it with the lands. Land. And well, sure, they wouldn't have died of starvation yeah. if the land hadn't been taken from them. Exactly. exactly. And then they were left with only one crop because they had small pieces of land. They hadn't their, what they used to have. Mm -hmm. They had small piece of land, so they had only one crop. And when that crop failed, the button. That was it. Goodbye. Because we were taught about yeah. the potato famine yeah. in a totally different aspect. So yeah. when we came over here and started hearing the stories oh, yeah. from all <laughs> yeah. of you local yeah. people, yeah. Yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. we were just blown away. And I'm yeah. like, I can't wait to get back to the States and share this. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. You yeah. Know? The potato famine was real. Mm -hmm. People died on the roadside. They died, and people you see, sometimes people can also exaggerate their suffering and that. But it's not exaggerated. They, yeah. It was a terrible time at that time, eighteen what forties to right up to say nineteen hundreds, and they went in their droves on the coffin ships. That was what they were called, the coffin ships, because some of them were dead before they reached America. Mm. You know, but with the droves, especially from the West of Ireland, which was the poorer part of Ireland. Mm -hmm. But before that, I mean, Ireland was very tribe because it was a very fertile country, and it had a strong culture mm -hmm. of music and poetry and all kinds of art, all kinds of things. And uh, then during that period, people just struggled to live. You know, so there would be people alive probably when I was a child who would, my father, was a policeman and he was doing the census you know the census mm -hmm. that? Yeah. out in the remote parts of the country and he was trying to establish the age of this very old lady and she was going he was like do you remember he was it and she said I tell you a girl a girl means love mm -hmm. I tell you a girl she said I remember the famine you see her parent or grandparent maybe because they all lived like together that she, uh, she said, and he was able then by adding and subtracting to roughly rough out, roughly work out when she was born. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I tell you, gosh, she said, remember Daddy telling the story? I remember the famine. I said, funny, that brings tears to my eyes now when I think of it. This old lady oh. trying to remember when she was born, and trying to remember. You know? That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And see, yeah. we wouldn't know that yeah. if we weren't talking to you. That is something that you're not Well, because it's find. a small area, and it's a small rural outside population. And when the potato famine it failed, when the potato, you see, the potato was their one crop because their land was taken. Yes. And there's only small allotments of land. You see, those, it's a complicated story, you know. Yeah. And yes. um, that was it, and starvation. And that's when the Quakers became very popular and much loved. The Quakers were really helpful. They helped as much as they could in feeding and that they did. Wow, I never knew that. No, we didn't know that. We were told something completely different completely about the Quakers. Different. Yeah. Wow. This yeah. is amazing. My mind is blown. No, I can't believe it. I thought you'd do all that. No. Oh, Ma'am, we were taught completely <laughs> Well, I would have been, I'm, I'm only vouching for this, but I heard that within right. my own family. Mm -hmm. You know, I put more faith into your testimony yes. than I do a textbook that's well, thrown in front of our faces. Well, my school. father came from a, a family that went back a long way, mm -hmm. and my father's father was a what you call a headmaster of a school okay. at the foot of uh, oh, no, 
not the Corrigan Mountains, um, I can't think of the name of them, and his father before him, and his father before him, back to the hedge schools. Did you hear of the hedge schools? Mm. Uh, no. no. I think so. The hedge schools were what, how they used to teach children before they were allowed to have schools. Oh. They had used to meet at a hedge, at a, you know? Wow. Yeah. So I'm very proud to say that my father's people went back to the hedge schools. My father's father, his father, so on, back to the hedge schools. Wow. I wish he were here today. He'd, oh, he could tell you a million things. Oh, oh wow. That is insane. That is. Yeah, they weren't. The schooling wasn't, you know, high up the list. I'm going back a long way now. I'm going back the 1800s. You know, yeah. mm. That is amazing. Yeah. That is just, but that's important. That shows our resilience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Irish are known as being tough. Oh, yeah. Well, they they are. Yeah. Yeah. They're, well, they're, they're known they as being to be. tough. To exist. But, yeah. To exist. But have it's, to, yeah. it's, it's, I think it's imperative to know where that toughness came from. Well, existing. Existing. Yes. And also the climate was tough. Just like wet and cold a lot of the times and so on, and uh, then hunger. It, like if you if your land was taken or a lot of it was taken, you wouldn't have enough to grow your wheat and barley and all your things. You know, you could grow vegetables, you grow a few this and keep a few chickens probably or whatever. You know. Yeah, and there's, there's some very good books written on this about that era. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's kind of one of the reasons that even though I'm doing a book about this, it's kind of one of the reasons we're going this route yeah. and filming it and doing a docu series mm -hmm. yeah. is because it people don't it pick up as many books as they, as they well, should. Well, it's not just that, but to actually see the emotion, to see the person yes. that's yes. talking yeah, to yeah. us, that, that yeah. brings it but more it home. Does, yes. I really do believe myself that groups of people like the Jews and like other people carry forever the wounds of the past. Yes. I really do believe that. I don't think you wash over it, you know, it's all gone. So, and I think that you're, and I don't want to do victimhood because I'm not into victimhood, but um, that if you've come through something and you've come out and you're resilient enough, you come out of it at the other end and your children and they went on to do whatever they do now, they become brain surgeons or whatever, that um, you, ha you rem still remember, and even in talk of life, I haven't talked about this in a long time, but my father used to talk about this. And he had a great memory of for things that happened, you know, because their house used to be raided, because he was one. There was a, he was one of eleven, and there was eight boys in his family, eight boys and three girls, and oh, my father was lovely, and uh, they were they used to have fun and everything else. But it was just a time when they were occupied by England, you know, and the black and tans, which were notorious mm -hmm. people, used to raid their house, used to come in, raid their house. And my grandmother was that toughie. My, <laughs> my grandmother, very slim, long black dress, did all her knitting, knit the socks with boys, and crocheted best for herself in autumn so she'd have them ready for winter. And this is the God's truth. She used to keep a habit to be laid out in so that nobody would have any trouble that when she died, there it was, all you have to do is put it on me. <laughs> oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, she, was, she was brilliant. Do you know, she was one of the most influential people, I think. And she'd sit in the corner in what they call the John Surlis chair. John Surlis was a man who designed a particular chair that got a prize in Canada at some big international festival. Uh -huh. And my father loved the Porto home industry and loved things like that. And he got this chair for Granny. And Granny used to sit in her chair, you know, the Surlis chair. And she used to do her crochet and her knitting and say her rosary and do all the things there. And she, she wouldn't let anything go astray. She'd, notice every single thing, you know, or she denied. No wonder, she ate boys, she reared eight boys and three girls. And they were the perfect Irish family. There were farmers, there were teachers, there were priests and alcoholics. Wow. It was the perfect. Okay, let's let, that's, that's exactly. Farmers, teachers, teachers priests, priests and, and alcoholics. alcoholics. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's just the perfect Irish family. That's it's a balance. It's, it's well rounded. Yeah, yeah about it was well rounded. And they were, you see, and my mother's family were very refined. It was just a separate her brother and her mother and her grandads. And they were all, you know, tea and china cups and nice, you know, everything laid out nicely. And they had a house that I'd say was like with black and tans raiding it, eight boys, you know, and <laughs> the girls. And Granny there, she was like, eh, she, they came in and wanted black and tans, and they were scary, I believe. I'm only not even the bottom of my family. And my grandma stood up and she said, you don't speak to a lady in her home like this. 
Yes, and they've sort of sorry, ma'am, off the wind. Tell oh, you. oh my, yeah. wow. <laughs> That's the kind she was. She didn't want to give it a first touch of love, you know. Mm -hmm. Talk she, about chastising she says, you them. You to speak to a lady in her home like this. Yeah, and she did boys. That's why she did boys, the three girls. Wow. Yeah. Oh, she was, she was wonderful. I love it. Yeah. I, and it's, it's the little things. I have to point this out because I'm still grinning yeah, yeah. about it. The fact that she had her resting clothes laid yeah. out for if she passed. That there it was already. You did have had no trouble. That is that on me. an amazing yeah. example no fear of, no of no fear. No yeah. fear of death whatsoever. Of not wanting to you know be what she a said burden. To me? My brother and I, my brother, my elder brother's dead now. Sadly, sadly, he was lovely. But he and I sat with her the night she didn't feel well. And after an hour or two, she said to us, she said her prayers there in a room, and she had her nice, comfortable bed. And she said, I think I'm going to die. She said, I'd like you to get the priest. So Michael ran off up to the presbytery and bought the priest out of Father Henry. And he came and anointed her, and she just closed her eyes, said all her regular prayers in the same order she always said them, closed her eyes and died. And I was there, and it took away totally from me my fear of death. It took away totally. I thought, she just said, yeah, I think I'm going to die, yeah. Yes. She, she knew. She knew. She knew. Yeah. She knew what she wasn't going to go. Oh, yeah. what am I going to do with my pearl necklace? You know. Yeah. yeah. No, no, she, no, knew no, she knew. She was comfortable yeah, with it. Totally comfortable. Totally at peace. And you see, wow. she yeah, and she reared a large family, and she was living in Ireland in the midst of the troubles when they were occupied, you know, and all that kind of thing. And she was. She was so funny. But she, she, oh, she was lovely. I think of her so much, you know. I didn't know my other grandmother. She was dead before I was born. My mother's mother. Mm -hmm. She was the one, the one who had the children in America and then had to come back home, you know. But, um, yeah. Isn't sharing these stories, that's what's keeping her memory alive. Oh, yeah. That's, oh, you know, I couldn't forget and it. this will be shared with yeah. long black, who watches Long black dress. Yeah. Long black dress. A rosary in the pocket. Um, her hair, white hair. And she'd wash it. And she'd put in little rolls and put hairpins into it. And sometimes when I was a teenager, I think I was really inspired to do it for her. I said, Granny, can I do your hair? <laughs> I had to roll it up. And my but not that bad. It wasn't too bad. Now, there was no uh, me does the who. But it wasn't too bad. And I used to, I used to uh, fix it up for her. Uh, she was lovely. She was such a good, looking back now in all the years she's got, I, she was such a good influence on us. Unbelievably Every strong. Yes. Unbelievably strong. You know, and nobody would intimidate her. Nobody. I don't know how she ran the black and tan. <laughs> that is, but that is, yeah. that's you inspirational. Do not speak to a lady in, you do not speak to a lady in a role like that. <laughs> Wow. Somebody standing their grounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had guns you know, at all. You know, they yes, had the work. Absolutely, I love it. I think <laughs> I think that even if she was shaking inside, you would never you would know. know. No, no, no. You wouldn't know. No, she was. No. She was really terrific and so loyal. And so, oh, she was. I remember when she was dying. I told you, my brother and I sat with her. And she wasn't well, but we thought she'd get through it in the morning. And then my father had flu and he hadn't been that well, so he got up because he knew she wasn't well. He got up. And the only time I ever saw my father cry, because she was very near death at that moment, and he put his head down and he cried and cried. And that's the only time I saw my father, who was quite a tough man, ever saw him cry. But she, yeah, they were all so loyal to him. She was his anchor. She was, yeah. And she had two sons, priests. One was a Franciscan. And the greatest storyteller you ever met. And we lovely kid because we'd be allowed to stay up late. And he'd tell stories and Daddy would say, Now, now, Davy, no more. One that story. Oh, okay, George. Just one, just one, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then he's another brother, his youngest brother, baby, was a priest out in the back end of Liberia in the worst possible times, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Oh, yeah. He was, yeah. And he'd come back and he'd be like a skeleton. And Granny would be feeding him up and looking after him and getting <laughs> extra vets for him and all that. Oh my gosh, fattening him up a little bit. That's right. I can, yeah, I can yeah. see that. What can I say? We couldn't thank Miss Mary enough. 
I guess you can say she's now our adopted Irish grandmother. So warm and welcoming, sharing her stories, her personal effects, which she actually sent home back to the States with us. They will be treasured and shared for all to see so that her stories can live on forever. Our next location, well, we knew it was coming, but how do you really prepare? How do you know you're going to react when the truth of what you've been told about the past is staring you in the face? The famine graveyards. This was real. This was history talking to us, wanting to be heard, and we were willing to listen. Back in the 1840s, famine grave. Um, they were buried over here, there's a tree, uh, there was an old church there as well, there's not much of it left, uh, there's an IRA grave just below it. Um, this, I cannot say there's spirits rambling around here, I've never felt them rambling, although I'm told they do. They do. But I, <laughs> I have never felt them. Yeah. Um, did anybody ever discuss anything that would have been underneath the church? No. That direction? Yes. Can we walk that way? I'm following y'all. <laughs> down, broke mm -hmm. and what have you, over the years. These probably dating back seven days old. They have some um, logging going on in the background over there. Not in recent times. Not in recent times. No. Maybe last under 150 years. Oh yeah, the last uh, 40 years. Last 40 years? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And um, there's one or two in the last 40 years anyway. And um, that's the old church there. That's um, here. Okay. The people from the famine buried there. Yeah. Okay. Mostly children? Uh, and adults, not just children. Like, it was man, woman, and child. Mm. So you might have entire families. Oh, yes. That have... Very possible, yeah. And also, um, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, TB was rampant. Mm -hmm. And again, you had whole families buried in the one grave. We've talked about that. We did, yeah. That's interesting. Yes. That's very interesting. Van, did you see this? That's a... Uh, Third time. That's a bird of prey. British, 1921. Whoa. So that's like recent. That's... Yes. That's nothing like way back. No. Wow. I must just kind of step in and... Outside to sit on if you wish. Oh, here she goes. <laughs> I think we've 
talking about a path to safety through here. I know that sounds really bizarre, but they keep talking about a path to safety. And it's weird because what they're saying, and we need to verify this because I'm not saying I'm right, is that they were able to take this to go to another path of, sa path of safety that would get them to a waterway or to an underground area that would get them away from people that were trying to hurt them, invade, things like that. Can you verify something for me? I could be wrong. I do this. Yes. Okay? <laughs> what I kept hearing when I saw that entryway was this was supposed to be a path to safety. Path to safety took them to another location where it was another path to safety where people would either take them to the nearest waterway or to an underground area to hide. Most possible. Most possible, okay. yes. Okay. Um, They're yelling at this, this is what's known as the Golden Mile. It's a walk. <laughs> okay. Okay. And yes, there are, what would you say, uh, sinkholes full mm -hmm. of water, very dangerous, over this way. Mm -hmm. uh, also, like, it would have been where in the 19, 1800s, 1900s, IRA men on the run, would have come down this way. They just yelled out 1889. So yeah. actually, yeah, a little bit before it 19, would have been, it would have, yeah. yeah, about 1889. Are we allowed to go down just a little bit further? Oh, yes, okay, let's go. They would also branch off and go that way. Okay. Need to wait and have him confirm. Okay, so they could go all the way this way, or actually, they would. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> That's what she just said. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. That way, would, you can walk that way, and you can get back up onto the main road. Again. Yeah. No, they branch that they, way. That would be correct. Yes. yes. And that would have been opened as yes. well. Mm -hmm. and they would have gone down the, down the tracks. Yeah. It, but they t they sent women and children. Men didn't stay with the women and children. No. Men took the more treacherous route and sent the women and children on a more flatter yes. land so that they wouldn't have issue, wouldn't hurt themselves. And they were less likely to be harassed. Absolutely. And but I, can I say this, though? They're not happy that all these trips are being taken. Uh, <laughs> they may not be. But those trees <laughs> were planted. Uh, in recent times, mm -hmm. and are being cut, they will be replanted. Okay. Okay. They will be replanted. So uh, that's something that I, like anything outside that boundary, okay. has been planted in recent times, but will okay. be replanted. Okay. Again, having said that, going back in the 13, 1400s, all of this area was forestry. All of it. And who cut it down? The Brits. Exactly. Now, are they going to be careful? Are they aware that there are actually some people that are buried out there too? I'm sure they are, yes. But again, if they're buried there, um, they most likely have been moved from there. Okay. I'm saying most likely. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure okay. because all these trees have been planted. As I said, within the last 40 years, these mm -hmm. trees were planted. Well, I don't talk to them. But, uh, you sense them now. I do sense them. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard of the Banshee? Yes. Yes, we've heard of the Banshee. I have actually seen her. Oh! What? Yes. Oh, oh yes. Uh, Do tell. Okay, get in front of me. You go. <laughs> tell Gwen all about it, hon. Yes. Uh, not a person you like to see or meet. Um, I have never looked at her face because I was always warned against. Yes. If you look at her face and she looks back at you, you're the next one gone. Mm -hmm. um, out the road from where I was born, there was a chemist living and his father with him and everything else. All right, he was an old man, the father. But I'm coming in from school one evening, four o'clock-ish, went home and I had seen this woman sitting on Val O'Connell, who was the chemist, on his wall, and combing the hair. I told my mum about it and she slapped me around the face. How dare you talk of something like that? That's a lie. I said, it's not. I saw a woman combing her hair on Battle Connell's wall. But, and I got slapped a couple of times because I kept repeating my story. So I ended up, I shut my mouth. 
Six o'clock the following morning, Val's father dropped dead. Fact of life. Can you imagine what that was like? You could read names on it and everything else. It would have been that thickness. Wow. And weathered down from age. From age, yeah. That's what that was. But anyway, getting back to the Banshee. Friend out shooting one night, a whole lot of us. Not too far from here, French Park, and on into Strokestown, right? And out lamping at night time for rabbits and what have you. Into a field, big field, um, probably 20 acre field. And we're about halfway through it, and we heard this wailing up behind us. Turned the flashlight round, nothing there, wailing stopped. Continued short distance, and it was back. Lights on it again, nothing there. Carlos, who lived locally to Strokestown, said, I'm off, I'm going home. In the morning we went for Carlos. There was no answer from his door. He was dead in his bed. Whoa. That was number two. Um, then recently, not too far from where I'm living now, I dropped Roisin up to a club where she used to go at night time. Uh, and I saw her, side of my eye, I caught her sitting on a wall. I wouldn't come back that road. I couldn't do it. came back another road. And when I went home, I said to my wife, told her, just saw, saw the bad she. She asked me where I told her. The following day, got word a neighbour had died. So wow. they are there. Let me ask you this. Do you think there's any significance to the fact that you've seen this not just once, not just twice, no. but three times? No, I, there's no significance to it. Uh, my grandfather dropped the O from our name. Mm -hmm. The Banshee follows O's and Max. So anyone with O or a Mac. So they're Oborn or MacDonald or whatever. The Banshee is more likely to appear to, to those people. Now, it's not everyone sees her. But those of us who have seen her don't wish to see her anymore. Once is enough in a lifetime. Of course. And again, having talked to the Banshee, this was nothing to do with the Banshee. When my grandmother died a good number of years ago in West Cork, I'm down there, and she was old Driscoll. And in the house with an uncle, we had walked five miles up to the home, the grandmother's home, from the town. Like she's in the middle of nowhere. The next stop is America from where she lived. And uh, sitting down, having a pint bottle of Guinness each, and there's a knock on the door. Open the door, there's no one there. So I went back in, continued drinking. Another knock. I got up this time and I walked to what we call the rock, which is in her garden, but it was the garden sloped away from, into a hill from her front door. I walked up this, and I had a view of probably four or five mile radius, every neighbor. Nearest neighbor to her would have been a mile away. There was nobody around. When I went back in, the uncle had disappeared, right? He wasn't staying there. Fear. I went to my bed. The following morning, I woke at 8 o'clock with my grandmother calling me, and she's in town in the hospital. So, when it comes to the O's, the Max, Banshee, spirituality, and that, the O's and the Max are more likely to be called upon first. That makes sense. That really does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Wow. And when my first wife died, same thing. I had cleaned the house, now we knew she was sick for quite a while beforehand, and um, she was in Sligo Hospital, I was living in Enniscrone at the time, and uh, somewhere around 4 o'clock in the morning, I had just finished cleaning the house, and I thought, I'm not getting into bed, i just lay on it, and there was a knock on the window, right? I knew she had passed. At 6 o'clock in the morning, there's a knock on the front door. So I just stood up, opened the window, yes, police. I know she passed. What? I said, my wife passed. 
How do you know? I said she came to tell me. Exactly. So. Exactly. The, act, the same thing essentially happened with my step-grandfather, with yeah. me. It and does happen. Yeah, it People does. don't always believe it, but it, it's a fact of life. When you're close to nature and close to what's around us, and like, none of those people are dead. No. They're living on a dimension that we just don't see. That's exactly what it is. They're there beside us. Mm -hmm. They're beside us now. We don't see them. Some of us can feel them. Mm -hmm. But I know they're there. Absolutely. I, it, it sounds rather crass the way that I put it, but it's, I tell people, this is a meat sack. This is a, yeah. It's like a car. Yeah. That's all it is. I'm still going to be me. I'm still going to be the same energy that I am. That's right. You can't destroy the energy. Regardless of what car I'm driving. You transform <laughs> the energy. You don't destroy it. Absolutely. And we are all energy. Absolutely. So you transform it to greater or lesser degrees of energy. But you, th like, that spirit within us goes on and lives on. So there is no, what we say, death. The body as we see it dies. Exactly. But the energy within us lives on. And it's like we talk of the fairies in this country. I know they're there. Mm -hmm. I have felt them. And I know a man who woke up one morning after being at a wedding, couldn't reach home, fell asleep under a haystack, and heard them playing music in the morning. Not just that, but he listened and listened. This was John McCormack, a well-known, famous Irish singer. He's well past now. But it, it was a friend of his woke up and heard them and wrote down the tune. That tune today is the London Derriere, which is sung numerous well, songs. More relatively new, definitely, yes. than the others. And again, relations coming to visit the yes. grave. There's that one, there's one over the gate that's fairly new. Um, that we passed when you didn't see it back the way that was fairly new as well. Um, and then leaving flowers over here as well. Yes. And what they do in the country in Ireland, they have graveyard masses. So they come and say a mass for all the dead within the graveyard. Oh, that's beautiful. And they do that once a year. So they're not forgotten. That is beautiful. That is something that unfortunately has has not lasted in the States. Um, my family is very old. You're wrong. It has lasted. Not where we but, are. No, but it lasted uh, wherever you have Native American. You have it. Yes. You're absolutely right. You're and, absolutely and that's right. where it lies. Uh, for me, I'm Roshi, my daughter, um, the Celtic mythology, the Celtic way of life lives on in us. Our next location that he took us to was not only beautiful, steeped in history, but quite possibly some of the oldest ruins that I have ever placed my feet upon. in the photograph even when I'd taken it. Uh -huh. The local priest came up to collect the photographs because he wanted them published. And he goes, he said, here, do you see this? He pointed it out. Wow. The priest, yeah. the priest yeah. pointed it out. That's this interesting. This has been a holy place going back at least 600 AD. Whoa. At least 600 AD. Whoa. There's been uh, religious here. Uh, the lake used to supply them with fish. Now it's all coarse fish, pike and perch. Um, and it would be nothing unusual for them to row across the lake. Instead of going up this way where they might get caught by the British because the churches as well back in the day were banned. And raiders going back in Norman times, the Norsemen and that, would have raided it. Mm -hmm. so, the, the clergymen, or the men in the church, would go across the lake and they would have uh, different houses around that they could go to mm -hmm. for food and come back and row across the lake at night time. Uh, as I said, back to 600 AD, there's 
been really good here. Wow. And we're, we're, we're free to walk around? Oh, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. steps. On her way to the Abbey, Vanessa was getting images, and she had noticed that there was a drop-down, but couldn't figure out what it meant. Well, I think it's safe to say that we found the drop-down, and this was it. I tried to get the best angle that I could. I would definitely say that this is most likely what she was seeing, as it matched what she was describing to a T. The history behind Ular Abbey is an interesting one at best. It was a monastic settlement that was founded in 1430 by the Dominicans, dedicated to St. Thomas. The Dominicans were named after St. Dominic, their founder, who was born in Spain in 1170. The years of 1608 and 1610, two inquisitions occurred. This led to the suppression of the friars. Although the possession of the land had passed to others, the friars remained quietly at Ular. By 1698, the friars fled the abbey due to penal laws. Five remained in the area. By the end of the 18th century, the abbey was in ruins. Although in ruins today, it is absolutely beautiful, and tourists flock here, it's easy to see why. This was the documented information that I could find. However, it is known that there's history that dates back here to 600 AD.
things we were up to. Uh, and there was no food on the table. We were hungry. And this is back in the trouble times, recent trouble times. And uh, I showed them how to poach with a, a curtain off a window, a curtain, net curtain, mm -hmm. on a, two brush handles down the river catching trout. Um, and then we're coming back. It was Jerry, his father, and myself. The father, Big Mull, we used to call him, was laughing at me in the water. Uh, look at that Egypt, look at that Egypt. What's he at? Right? Until I got the first big trout. That stopped the land. While descending back down the steps, I couldn't help but just feel the energy of the ones who have passed. Touching the walls, taking my time, watching my step. When we reached the bottom, I took one last look into the chambers where the kitchen were. I could imagine hearing the laughter, the cooking, hearing the cries of when they were terrified of being punished, of being found for just practicing their religion. One last look in the awe of the construction of what's left of this beautiful, beautiful abbey and the secrets that it still holds today. We decided to call this episode Lessons Learned, and for good reason. We want to thank Jim, Mary, and Dono for everything, for sharing their personal effects, their home, pictures, their time out of their day, to be the walking history books, to share their knowledge, their history, not only of their land, but of their families, to, well, set us right and the rest of the world right to let us know what the facts were. Because let's face it, what we know as the Great Potato Famine was, well, anything but. It was the Great Famine. From 1846 to 1851, it was known as the Famine Years. Although the potato crop was largely wiped out due to disease, other crops such as grain and livestock were possible. However, forced exports were being sent to England. You see, what happened was, these people owned their land. However, they were overtaken, their land taken from them, and they were forced to pay a type of rent. If they couldn't pay on their own land, it was forced eviction time, whether it be soldiers barging in, or to have their homes burnt down. Any means necessary. A genocide of sorts. I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed visiting these famine graveyards. Some of them so old that there's nothing but small stones left, just nubs in the ground. I couldn't help but wonder what are the stories of some of these people? What happened to them? What was their journey? But there's nothing left but a headstone. No name, no inscriptions, nothing. The coffin ships that Miss Mary Gallagher spoke of, that is what struck us. That was just so sad. The history of the coffin ships is a grim one. The first one that left for Quebec, Canada, well, let's just say it wasn't good at all. Most of these ships could take anywhere from 40 days to three months. You heard me right, three months to reach land. I can't even imagine. It all depended on the skill of the captain. It was bad enough that you were being driven away from your home, but now here you are, naked, in most cases, alone, no money, nobody, nobody that you know to be with you. Being forced on these ships, your only way of survival. Most of these people would end up arriving to the new land dead. 
hence the reason for the name of the Culkin ship. In 1847, approximately one out of five died from disease or malnutrition when they had sailed to British North America. Due to the tensions between North America, declaring its independence from England, the Irish would feel the wrath in different ways upon their arrival to North America. Irish need not apply, but yet they forged on. They made their way. They made it. I don't know how they did it over all those years, because for Vanessa and I, just these few days alone was mentally and physically exhausting, yet rewarding. We shall remember them. We just hope you will too.